Kia ora koutou, I'm Russell Brown and this is The Internet of Awesome Things, a podcast all about the Internet of Things brought to you by Spark. One of the things that takes IoT beyond the realm of tech hype is the fact that it's so often just plain functional and does jobs that no one has to spend time in meetings conceiving as a use case. And for business, one of those jobs is the very basic issue of knowing where your stuff is. Whether it's kit that hits the road or things that move around a site, asset tracking is a key use for the Internet of Things. In this episode, we'll look at the experience of one of New Zealand's biggest companies and talk about what's on offer and what's to come in IoT asset tracking. Maybe we'll even find the Holy Grail. To aid me in the search, I'm delighted to be joined by Kevin Drinkwater, Chief Information Officer for Main Freight, which uses a network of IoT devices to track something we all want tracked hazardous waste bins. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Russell. Now, if I could start with what I talked about in the intro there, about the way that IoT solutions are often deeply functional. You know, they solve a well-established problem. Was that your experience at Mainframe? Well, absolutely. We'd had a a problem for a long, long time, which was knowing where stuff was. And, uh, you know, explicitly, where are our segregation bins? And these are very um, useful devices for us for segregating dangerous goods to make them safe when we transport them. And we had no idea where we were, where they were. Well, not where all of them were. Uh, We knew where some of them were. Right, did you try various other ways of tracking them? Because it's quite important, clearly. Well, we we started off with the tried and true manual methodology. And really that wasn't working because the more the business grew, the more we had of these things, and the more time pressure people had that going around the yard and trying to find these things and, and sending an email as to what you had just, just wasn't working. And you tried tech solutions too? Um, no, we hadn't tried tech solutions, but we knew that IoT was a solution that would work for us, and we'd been working for some time on that. We just hadn't had the magical crossover between the technology that we needed and cost, and importantly, battery life. What was it about it that worked? Was it was it something as simple as battery life that that, that turned it? Battery life made it worthwhile for us. Uh, these are devices that you don't want to be changing the battery on every three weeks, every three months even. We're, we're hopeful it'll be three years to five, five years and based on testing. That, but that was the critical thing. It was battery life that was the Achilles heel of all the other solutions we'd looked at over the last 10 or more years. So this was a long search. Oh, a very long search. And um, I had more hair then, and, and a lot of it was scratching about because because we just couldn't find a solution that would work. We actually found some very interesting solutions that could tell us all sorts of things, um, but they actually couldn't, the battery wouldn't last. And also, the I think the other problem was that the, the coverage of, of the network that they were on was just not there either. Because uh, your, your system, as it operates now, is on the low run network, isn't it? It is. And, and that really is the, the other Achilles heel for it, because cellular technology wasn't, wasn't good enough. And cellular, of course, um, takes more battery. So, you know, to, to power up. So, so the low RAR was, was actually um, uh, excellent for us. It really made it capable. Uh, it improved the battery life. You know, it had a real big knock-on effect. So what's out there now? How many of these bins are there? Oh, there's around 400 of them, we think because we actually haven't found all the bins that, that we know we've got out there yet. But every time we find a new one, we're putting, putting them on. So I think we're over 300 now that we've actually got the devices on. We've bought 400 and we're waiting to find more. Oh, that's quite interesting. So there, there, was, a, there was an extent of once you'd installed it, you found out how much you didn't know, like where, where things you knew you owned were. E- exactly, exactly. We, we actually, we knew we didn't know... Uh, where they were, uh, but we didn't know how quite how bad it was, and and we're actually the numbers that, that we've got are actually creeping up. We thought we had less, right? Um, how key was it that the solution that you did eventually settle on with Spark was quite simple compared to some of the other ones you looked at? It, that was the absolute key. All we wanted to know was where it was and 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 when it was there. So these things basically phone home once a day, don't they? They've they got do. a little thing called an oyster on them and they say, I'm here. Absolutely. And you can set it to phone home as many times as you want. But um, we only need to know where, where it last was today, basically, because our decisions are based on a 24-hour, 12-hour turnaround, and that's good enough for us. Right. Yeah. When you're talking about turnaround times and that kind of thing, that, that's a business need, isn't it? Was that how you approached it rather than as a tech project? It was totally a business 
decision. It was, it was totally a business need. It was the business that had the pain point. And, you know, there was, there was certainly no basis for saying, hey, here's a cool tech, we should use this on something, let's find it. We knew that we were buying uh, between 50 and 100 of these $3,000 boxes a year. Right, and, and you were losing them. Losing them, and, and losing them because we couldn't find them in our own yards, but also because customers were actually having them delivered to them, and somehow they got lost somewhere, you know, through no fault of their own or, or them trying to steal it or something. But we also had other situations where people used it as um, smokers for their fish and various other things when they got their hands on them. Oh, that's Kiwi ingenuity, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, did you find it changed the way the business operated and the way people behaved it? It, within the business once you had the system up and running? It's completely changed the culture now. Uh, firstly, they don't think uh, of knowing where their segments are as, as an impossible task or something they don't want to do. It's the, but the critical thing for us is because we have this freight imbalance between the North Island and the South Island, principally from Auckland, and we have to get these bins back to Auckland and, and Hamilton uh, mainly, and it has meant that they are there, um, that people see them and they know they have to get them back because they know the guy in Auckland knows that they've got them. So there's no hiding anymore. And it didn't take long for them to find that out. So the culture changed completely and people knew they've got to rapidly get them back you know, and, and, and so we can make use of them. So the guy in Auckland knows because he's got a dashboard, right, of, of where all the bins are. Yes. Um, who, who can see that? Everybody that's associated with that operation. Yeah, so so they can see it in, in all the branches, and it's um, so they they know they don't have to go and look that they've got fourteen of them there. They can see on a dashboard that that um, three of them have been sitting there for seventy two hours. You know, one of them just got there last night. They can see the whole parameters, so they know what they have to do. There's there's no hiding. There's no excuses. Well, given that this seems to have worked really well, it's fixed your problem. Um, are you looking at IoT solutions for other parts of the business? Because you're a big business. Oh yes, there are lots of possibilities, and you know you talked about the, the complex before um, types of IoT devices, and we have used some of those and trialled them in the states. For instance, uh, uh, devices that we put in boxes that can tell where it is um, that a flight's taken off, therefore it turns the um, and these ones have been on the. Um, GSM network, but how they um, so it turns them off as they uh, when the plane takes off, turns it back on when they land, all those sorts of things. But they were hundreds of dollars each, and I suppose I should also say one of the things they can do is the light center them. So if somebody opens the box and you've got a geofence around that, you get an alert to say the box has been opened, so there's been some tampering in the in the wrong place. But hundreds of dollars each, and the and the principle was that we would actually get them back once they got to our customers and got delivered. But that hardly ever happened. So, you know, it was a one-time use. We're, we're spending more money on the devices than actually, um, <laughs> than actually any benefit. And actually, it's afraid of the- that's, that, that's kind of neat. It works really well until people get their hands e- exactly on it. Exactly right. Yeah. Do you think business in general understands IoT well? Well, the thing about IoT is the business is all very worried about it. I think it's, it's one of those things that's, you know, a three-letter algorithm and it's something to do with IT. But they, they don't actually need to worry about or actually understand it. They should think of it like TV. You know, nobody worries about how the TV picture gets to you. It's just there. And IoT is is just the same. It just tells you where it is, what's it doing, and everything like that. You don't need to worry about what's in the box. You just need to consider what the advantages are of using it. Um, You were an early adopter in New Zealand terms of of this kind of solution. Do you think your competitors are looking at you and seeing how it's going? I'm not sure. We don't really gauge ourselves on our competitors. But, you know, I suppose one thing, if competitors were interested in something like this, it's about tracking equipment, uh, we'd be very happy to share our um, our experiences. That's jolly decent of you. Um, but you are you're not just a New Zealand company. You're a global company. It, is it important to you to choose systems that can work anywhere? In this particular case, no. But it means that we can learn and apply those learnings to our businesses in Europe, United States, Australia, and, and Asia. So we we have a go to source of saying, hey, if you want something like this, we've we've got it. What are the key things you've learned? Well, um, perseverance <laughs> to try and find something. And you've always got to have hope that you know that something is going to turn up at the end of the day. But 
Um, the key thing that we've learned is if we can get the right device for the right cost with the least maintenance, we'll always win the business over to solve the problem. Right. And on the other hand, um, in making this podcast, what I'm learning is that Every discussion about IoT ends in talking about the value of the data it generates. Are you looking at the ways to harness that? We are in that we are, uh, are looking at the turnaround times um, of these devices and, and trying to work out how many of these boxes we really need now. So because we know where they are and track them, we can actually reduce our spend on, on purchasing more. So so with, there's that value, but it's, it's a very, I suppose, closed loop network that we're using for this. But it has shown to the business, if we can do this with this type of equipment, what the possibilities are with other things like tracking individual pieces of freight. Well, Kevin, I'm fascinated to see where you go next with this, and I'm glad this worked for you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. I'm joined now by a man who helped sell Main Freight at Solution, Sparks Managed Services Lead, Michael Stribling. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Well, I must say you've got a happy customer there, but I, I wonder why did Spark focus on asset tracking as the first area to start offering IoT solutions? To me, it comes down to two things. The first is that it's a it's a big problem. So if you think about all the different companies and organisations that have assets and things of value that are out and about, uh, there's a massive number of things that, that actually could be tracked. So for me, it's a big market, it's a big opportunity. And I guess as well, um, it's a relatively simple solution. Um, and so it's a simple device that you can clip onto a, onto an item and, and really be able to get a, an outcome pretty quickly. And it kind of meets that definition of a basic business problem, doesn't it? You need to know where your stuff is. Yeah, absolutely. And and that is a that's a common, a really common problem. You, you'd go and talk to a, a range of different organisations, whether that's a manufacturer, somebody in transport or logistics, uh, somebody in, in agriculture. There's a whole lot of things of value or things that, that people want to be able to track and just know where they are. Um, but also a whole lot of problems around supply chain. So how do I manage cost and efficiency in the way that I'm managing getting things from where I am to, to where my customers want them. And so, you know, lots of opportunity. So what's the, what's the product here? What are the core components of your asset tracking offering? Look, I, it's actually relatively simple. Uh, you know, IoT can sound complex, but in reality to me, it's pretty simple. So there's three components. The first is the network, so you've got to have a way to be able to connect to the device. The second is a physical device, something that's actually capturing location information, transmitting that back through the network. And then the third is a platform, which to me really means a way to visualise the information that we're tracking or capturing on the on the sensor, uh, and then being able to do something with that. And, and that's actually where the value lies, is being able to do something with that information. So in, the, in an asset tracking example, to be able to uh, to to tell customers where their items are at what point in time, to be able to to stop loss, to stop theft, all those kind of benefits. Because, um, yeah, I, I've seen the devices. They are pretty simple. They're not glamorous devices, are they? No, <laughs> not at all. They're, they're, uh, they're kind of um, pla- pretty hard plastic encased uh, sensors, really. And they've got to be ruggedized because if you're putting a sensor on the side of a truck or uh, or a segregation bin or on the side of a rail wagon, um, you know, they're exposed to the elements, they get banged around, they're exposed to forklifts, they're, you know, there's a whole lots of things that can happen to them. And so they are very functional, pretty basic uh, look and feel, but really they're there to do a job, which is to be able to identify where the asset is and and communicate that back. So they don't need to be to be snazzy, they just need to kind of work. Oh, I'm interested in the fact that you partnered to deliver this solution, both the devices and the, the dashboard end, which is um, done by a company called Blackhawk. Was that a deliberate decision? Do you think partnering is something that works well in this space? Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we're good at... Th- at, at, at part of part of IoT, really. Um, so we, we, as a communications business, are great at building the networks and being able to to manage data across networks. We're very good at uh, being able to, to to help customers understand the technology and how that technology uh, and that data can be used in their business. But for us, 
designing a, a device is not our core business. We're not hardware engineers. We're not there to manufacture those types of devices. Uh, and actually, there are specialists and gl- businesses that are focused globally uh, in, in quite specific areas that, that we need to work with. So Black Oak is a great example where they are working not only in New Zealand, but globally looking at um, asset tracking and, um, and being able to build solutions around that. So it kind of made sense for us to partner. Where were you at when you first took that solution to Main Freight? Were there things that you learned or maybe had to add once you'd gotten up close to some you know, real world business needs? Look, I guess for us, IoT has been a journey that we as a business have been on. I think it's taken us two or three years really to, to understand the market and to work through uh, both internally but also with our customers figuring out how to make solutions really work uh, in the real world uh, and it's been great to partner with Main Freight because they've been open to uh, being I guess on, on the leading edge of using the technology um, so absolutely there were things that we learned as we went along we, we had a lot of the elements of the solution that we that we had in place um, but you know one of the, the examples of something that we've we've delivered for Main Freight is uh, they wanted to be able to see goods coming into uh, into the warehouse house. Um, now, the inside of a building can be can be more challenging from a, from a wireless perspective. And so we rolled uh, effectively little repeater uh, devices that, that actually extend the coverage into the building environment. So understanding some of those requirements, we certainly have evolved um, you know, the, the elements of our offer and our product as we've learned. Uh, Kevin told me he wasn't too bothered about what his competitors were doing, but um, I'm, I'm guessing that you've taken a similar solution to other logistics companies? Yeah, look, it's something that uh, logistics, transport, freight companies are, are absolutely uh, focused on. And so, you know, we're talking to, to a range of companies in New Zealand that are, that, that see the benefits, not, you know, and for actually a range of different use cases, even in, even for main freight, there, there's probably 10 or 15 different use cases for asset tracking. If you think about the different types of assets, trucks, containers, forklifts, assets around around their, their depots. Um, and equally, you know, a lot of their competitors and a lot of companies around New Zealand are, are thinking about this. So certainly we're looking at where are the opportunities uh, to, 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 to bring these types of technologies to scale. I, I guess logistics is an, op- is an obvious one because it's about moving things around. Are there sectors where you think IoT asset tracking would be useful that might surprise people? Yeah, look, you know, an example might be agriculture. Um, so being able to track... Uh, fruit or um, it could be wine vats or e- any of those types of high value um, those types of high value items um, through a supply chain and and agriculture is is similar to logistics in that um, you know it, it's actually the core goods that sit in a truck or, or sit in a train that companies um, you know that are valuable so being able to to track things in that kind of environment or it might be healthcare so uh, you know high value things like beds or or blood supplies going through a hospital again really important that um, DHBs and and understand where those items are at any one point in time in their environment. Oh, see, that's interesting because that's largely indoors. Mm-hmm. So, the you know, the, the, does similar principles apply for indoor asset tracking? I guess that the that those three components that I talked about, the network, the device, uh, and the platform, uh, are all similar. Um, all the same. Uh, what's more complex in, in an indoor environment is you have walls, uh, you have concrete, uh, your te- buildings tend to be built of concrete. Uh, they, there's, there's lots of things that actually impede uh, the signal within an indoor uh, environment. And so it is more challenging indoor uh, to, to manage the network and the communication. Um, and we've learned that as we've, as we've tested the products out. So what technology are you using for indoor? Is it different? Uh, so no. So so in the in the example of uh, Main Freight, we're using our IoT network, our LoRa network that we that we talked about. Uh, what we've done though is put little what we call coverage in a box. So effectively, little repeater, um, almost like a broadband modem, into into each of the depots, uh, so that we get coverage in that environment. Um, so we've got technology that like that that works. Um, there's a whole range of other technologies that you can use to make tracking work uh, indoors. So, you know. Wideband, uh, RFID. There's lots of technology, Wi-Fi, uh, lots of technology that you can use. And for us, I guess part of our experience is we, we use all of those technologies as as part of our business. So we've we, we're understanding how to kind of stitch them together to make this solution work. Is there a solution for both indoor and outdoor at you know, at the same time? Because I've had someone describe that to me as the holy grail for asset tracking. 
It is the holy grail, I guess. Uh, there are certainly solutions that work both indoor and outdoor. And, and actually the main freight solution uh, is one that works outdoor and indoor. But it's, I guess, the quality of the solution. So if you want to know at any one point in time, no matter where you are in a building, where a particular asset or item is, that's more complex because, as I talked about, uh, there's challenges around the communication, the way the network works. And so you've got to be able to figure out the physical environment and how do you manage for that. So certainly it's possible. Uh, the solutions that are out there work in some use cases, but we haven't got to those solutions that work in every use case yet. Um, it strikes me there are also some interesting possibilities as this technology becomes more widely accepted. The, the costs are such so that, say if I've got a particularly valuable thing, you know, consignment that I'm sending, I could put a tracker in my own parcel so I knew where it was independent of the people moving it. That's that's possible, isn't it? Yeah, it's completely possible. And it becomes an interesting challenge for uh, you know the likes of Main Freight and for freight and logistics companies in that they need to be adopters of this technology um, because if they're not, then then they might fall behind their customers. And so I guess that's an added advantage and driver of, of, of being early adopters of the technology. How do you see this market growing, just finally? IoT generally or asset yeah, well, tracking? Yeah, well, specifically asset tracking. I think there is a huge opportunity in asset tracking. As I said, we've only scratched the surface on both the use cases where asset tracking works, uh, but also uh, the types of industries where, where we could see it applied. So I think about, as I talked about, you know, freight and logistics, manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare, there's huge opportunities in each of those markets. I think that asset tracking will be a, a core part of the IoT story uh, moving forward, and that's, I guess, why we've chosen to, to invest in asset tracking as a, as a lead for us. Well, we'll look forward to seeing how you go on it. Cheers, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all for this episode of the Internet of Awesome Things. If you liked this episode, please feel free to review or rate us on your chosen podcast platform. And if you want to know more about any of the topics we cover, visit spark.co.nz forward slash IOT or email iot at spark.co.nz. And if you like this, you may also like my other podcast. It's about AI or artificial intelligence and it's called Actually Interesting. You can find it in the future section of the spin-off website or just search your chosen pod platform. Thanks to our guests and to Spark, Cooper Studios and Gareth Thomas for our sweet theme music. I'm Russell Brown and I'm looking forward to catching up again soon because you and I, we have 20 billion things to talk about. <laughs>